Welcome everyone. The Government Information Service and the National Television Network presents In Focus, a live 90-minute discussion program looking at the plans and policies of the government of St. Lucia. There's certainly going to be a segment where we'll be able to interact with the public and you can do so by calling in on the number that we will be presenting on our screen and you can also join us live on Facebook and we'll be certainly reading those questions that you have. My co-host, this initial program, Lisa Joseph. Lisa, certainly we gotta stay in focus. Absolutely, thank you so much, Ryan. Good morning to St. Lucia. Let's not forget St. Lucia in the diaspora. Most importantly, we want to be hearing from you. That's where uh, Facebook comes in when we have our uh, question and answer segment for the public. But in focus, um, 90 minutes, and as Ryan indicated, gives you that opportunity for you to be able to hear in detail the, the government's plans and policies and have you interface with government representatives, officials, as well as ministers of government. Uh, the program gives you also sort of recap of the big stories happening in government, and that's in the throw of things some of the stories get lost. And over the last week, one of the big stories coming out, out of the government of St. Lucia is the opening of the Sufre Town Square. And we know that Sufre is considered to be the sort of breadbasket of tourism for the island. And there is a transformation happening down in Sufre. Uh, so we've had the square with Old Trafford a complex as well falls into that. We had before the square and the uh, complex transformation, we had seen uh, the Hummingbird Beach Park opening up and completely renovated. So we now go to a report by Anisia Antoine that encapsulates what the uh, opening ceremony was like for the Sufra Town Square. Development on the West Coast is moving at an increasingly high rate with a newly built Sufra Beach Park, Farmer's Market, Bus Terminal and now officially opened Sufra Square. The redesigning of the Sufra Square included installation of urban umbrellas, a water fountain and the Freedom Monument. Parliamentary representative for Soufre, Honorable Herod Stanislas, expressed her satisfaction with the outcome of the project. I am extremely proud and happy that we have been able to deliver to you a state-of-the-art facility in the heart of Sulphur City. And I believe that you, the people of Soufre, ought to feel equally proud to have such a facility right here in downtown Sufre. The new design should enhance Sufre's sense of place, be memorable, and appeal strongly to the emotions of both visitors and locals. The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Honorable Alan Chastney, explained that the economic developments in Soufre will directly impact the economic development of the surrounding communities. The standard of square that we would have delivered to the people of Soufre would not have been in keeping with the rich history. And you heard the beautiful singers come up here and tell us the story, the rich history of what Soufre is about. And I'm saying to you that people in the world want to know that story. And we want it that when they come through the town, that we can now start seeing attractions develop around town, that be able to take advantage of that opportunity. The construction work on the redesign of the Sufra Square, which began in 2017, was funded by the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, under the Constituency Development Programme. Councillor Bill Wang is the charge d'affaires of the Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan. I have to say, but for the relentless efforts and dedication of the Honorable Prime Minister Shasane and uh, Minister uh, Stanislas, I would, wouldn't have been here today. And I believe there are more opportunities. We come back here for more projects that St. Lucia and Taiwan work together. The opening ceremony of the Sufra Square took place on Wednesday, July 31st, 2019. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. Plans are advancing to enhance parts of Castries through the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project. 
The project, which is being funded by the World Bank, seeks to enhance the competitiveness of tourism in the region by facilitating movement of tourists between the participating countries, using ferries, improving selected tourism sites, and strengthening capacity for regional tourism market development. Here's Nisha Charles. The government of St. Lucia has identified the Castry City tourism product as a priority for St. Lucia, with targeted investment sites and activities aimed at making downtown Castries more pleasant and attractive to tourists as well as residents. As part of the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project, government intends to implement several investment initiatives to revitalize downtown Castries. These include the pedestrianization of the William Peter Boulevard, the upgrading of sidewalks, works for the improvement of the visitor experience walking through Castries, and the upgrading of the Castries Central Market. As it relates to the William Peter Boulevard, project manager Dr. Lorraine Nicholas says the upgrade will ultimately add economic value to the area. So the fundamental aim is to really make the, the William Peter Boulevard a more pedestrian-friendly space, a space that is more conducive to relaxation, a space that is more conducive to hassle-free shopping. So a place where locals and visitors can go and sit and enjoy local cultural entertainment, as well as dine, have a cup of coffee. The underlying aim is to bring more money into the economy so that we can benefit more from the tourism sector. Also forming part of the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project is a facade improvement program for existing small businesses. Facade improvements are a means of enhancing the economic viability of these businesses as well as improving the aesthetic image and the attractiveness of the broader Castry Central Business District neighborhood to retail customers and visitors. Under the ORTCP, we will be, the government of St. Lucia, um, given financial incentives to the property owners. So this would be in the form of matching grants, 50-50. Um, the idea is that a business would put some of the funds and the government would put the other half of the financing, ranging up to 10,000 US dollars. And one might ask, Persons might say, why, why doesn't the government give all of the money? Well, it is a case where you would not want this to be, there to be interest simply because it is free money. Persons see it as free money mm -hmm. and so they jump on board. You want there to be a level of ownership that persons see that there is value in doing this. It is their building. It is their property. This is what is being developed and the government is contributing to it. Some 15 million U.S. dollars has been earmarked for St. Lucia under the project. Another project taking place within the government is the Hironora International Airport redevelopment and works are currently underway there. The project is now in its first phase, which will include the preparation of the site for the construction. The general manager of the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, uh, Mr. Darren Snack, informed the GIS that the renovations will include a brand new 337,000 square foot terminal building, new road infrastructure and new parking aprons to cater for the increasing capacity at the airport. Besides the physical infrastructure, what you'll be seeing a lot of improvement is customer experience, um, in terms of the human comfort, in terms of the technology that will be used at the airport. Um, I, I don't want to say too much on the technology now, but we are ready to build a first-class world airport in this part of the world. And we are very, very, very excited and proud to be a part of this project. Mr. Stank also informed that a new improvement will allow for a more climate-resilient structure. The standards that are used for, for example, seismic loading, and I say, you said, a little easier, that's earthquakes. The standards that we've used for um, hurricane category five hurricanes on this project are even higher than what we use for our local. And again, this project is done in consultation with um, our designers who have a local engineering support, professional engineering support team with them. So that has been taken into account as well as um, we've spoken about the flood mitigation. So there are many steps that we have taken. We had a World Bank DVRP project um, that recommended the level to construct, so that has been incorporated in the design. And there are other interventions through our partners in the Department of Infrastructure um, that are uh, being undertaken. Mm -hmm. 
that was the general manager of Snatsba there, Mr. Darren Snack. And the redevelopment project at the Hirono International Airport is estimated as $175 million. So look there at some of the stories making the news from the government of St. Lucia. Brian? Yes, Lisa, certainly we've got our first three stories in our new segment and certainly great areas of focus. The Sufre Square, something that has really brought a lot of joy to the citizens and the members of the community down there in Sufra. We also looked at the ORTC, and we know that the plans had always been around of late in terms of what's really going to happen in the redevelopment of the city of Castries and the Huonora International Airport Redevelopment Project. So certainly very timely to be in focus on our program today. And Devin, you could see how these projects tie into in one focused area of absolute development for the country. And while it may seem that it is centered completely around tourism, which is to, to a fact, however, it also enhances the daily lives of St. Lucians. I'm thinking of Sufra, and I'm now excited about taking a trip down there with my own family. Um, I've had a number of friends who said that they went last weekend and how much fun it was. Uh, but I'm thinking now that we're going to be seeing a shift in the domestic tourism, we don't talk much about that, and that's important for St. Lucian to be able to get out and enjoy the sights and sounds, um, the beauty of St. Lucian. We have people who pay thousands of dollars to come to St. Lucia to enjoy it, but it's right here with us, and we do not do enough of that. So my thinking is now we could also see uh, we now have staycation on, and so St. Lucian's can now begin to say, well, there's something to do to pick up the family, go down an additional attraction down in Sufra, if not to just take pictures, be at the square, take some pictures, see what the improvements are like. It should be a very exciting time. And I'm looking forward to when works will begin with the whole pedestrianization for the William Peter Boulevard. Yes, uh, Sufra certainly has been in the spotlight of late and did mention earlier in the, the fact that the Hummingbird Beach Park and the groundbreaking ceremony for the whole sporting infrastructure project being put on by government. So that in, in itself really whet the appetite for what is really going to happen right now. And then since we had the opening of the square, the official opening, and it, it, we saw the, the pictures coming live out mm -hmm. of, of Sufra in that evening and how much the community really got involved with it. And uh, the beach park is, is something that really enhances the, the product itself, gives a greater opportunity for economic development within the community of Sufra for the members of the community to maybe get into small businesses. We also noticed that the sporting persons within the area being given the encouragement that they are going to have some state-of-the-art facilities and also a new cricket ground down at Ruby. So that in itself set up and then the whole project in terms of the Old Trafford with the terminal and yes. it's really transformed the town and now with the opening of the square the, the the buzz i'm sure will be around for quite some time now in the city of castries we, we know it's really going to take some getting used to it with the boulevard not being filled with persons commuting via vehicular traffic and now just more into a pedestrian space a different be life to to the city as well where um that sort of bustling feel and i, I mentioned family again because my stories coming out of my family, coming from my mother, my grandmother, often spoke about how uh, the city of Castries back before used to be this sort of hub, especially at night where families can take a stroll and enjoy um, the, the scenery with, with uh, all of the window um, displays and so forth. So it'll be interesting to see how we can incorporate some of that old uh, sort of uh, appeal of what Castries used to be and put it incorporated into so a new appeal as well. So it would be it would be something interesting for St. Lucia to see how we can raise Castries, the city of Castries back to prominence. The Huonora International Airport Development Project uh, something that has been around for quite some time and mm. the entire nation and the traveling public will be looking forward to that. And for, for the Hiranura International Airport, for St. Lucia, it's a mammoth project, but it's a very necessary project. Uh, once we are able to get that complete, and I think the exponential growth that we see in the tourism industry, it can only begin to sort of add the sort of value to the St. Lucia tourism product. Um, St. Lucia now is moving towards more of a sort of high-end brand. 
And we need facilities that will complement that because if you are attracting visitors, they're going to pay the monies to come in, we have to be able to give them the sort of amenities and facilities that correlates with what that high-end brand is. Um, and for St. Lucians as well, for our own national pride, for our feel, even when we travel, we get to use that very same facility. We don't want to have one treatment when we get to places like Miami, LAX, and so forth. And then when we, we are at the Huron or International Airport, a vastly different sort of environment. So if we can step in sync with what's happening globally, I think we, we can feel good about having a facility that is world class. Yes, Lisa, we certainly look forward to it. Well, at this point, we'll take our first break on our program. We'll be back on In Focus. Trafficking happens in plain sight. Know the signs. See it. Report it. To report suspected cases of human trafficking, call the TIP hotline at 847. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. The that no, they do. think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. Use organic and Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rise St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. Welcome back. We will have the introduction of our special guest, Lisa. Uh, yeah, and special guest indeed. Uh, in focus, we are very, very happy to have Prime Minister Honorable Alan Chastney with us as our first guest. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the key areas, and we uh, heard from the Prime Minister during the budget address for 2019 2020 that the government is focusing on some very key areas that will end. Uh, sort of generate the um, economic activity and sustain it as well. We won't have time to go through all of the key areas, but we'll zero in on some of the, what we consider to be the prime ones. Uh, so the government has been engaged in restructuring the economy, as we heard from the Prime Minister during the budget address. And to do that, the, to centralize it, there's a medium term development plan for the period 2019-2022. We begin to see some shift in the economy. Um, last figures we heard that the economy had grown and by some 8% since the Alan Chassé administration took office. And so we want to say good morning to Prime Minister Alan Chastney and talk to us about what putting this plan together was like. Just give us a, a sort of an, 
capsulation of that thought process because when you founded the economy, you'd always said that it was not growing as it should to sustain St. Lucia. So what was the thinking behind developing this plan? So the, the process of developing the plan really started in um, 2013 when I took over as the, um, the leader of the United Workers' Party. And the first thing that we did was we went on a retreat with about just over 100 of our party supporters, young, old, I've been there for a long time, new entrants into the market, um, different uh, farmers, workers, business people. And we developed a, a vision, mission, and value for the party. And so the, the, the vision of the party was that we were going to um, uh, focus on uh, delivering a globally competitive education system. So an education system that didn't just get you so you had a certificate, but a quality of education that would allow you to compete against foreigners coming into St. Lucia. And also that if you traveled, that you would be uh, able to get a job abroad. That we said that we would have a um, affordable quality healthcare. Um, we said that everybody would have security, regardless of where you lived. And the fourth one was that we would create economic opportunity. So those were the, the, the fundamentals of what United Workers Party was all about. So once we've achieved that, then the basic, the next thing is we then started reviewing um, the, the country and we, we created, I think it was six different groups that looked at um, the country and achieving those, th that vision. Um, so once that had been finalized, we then brought it all together and it was then displayed in our, our party manifesto. And that's why we've always said that our party manifesto um, was not generated by polling. It was generated by what we thought the country needed to be able to grow. The next thing that I personally believe in is determining what the potential is rather than percentage growth. So I always use the example of a kid who's getting a 40% school mark and comes home and says to his mother, I'm doing 10% better, mm. right? He's still failing, right? The, the goal should be about getting 100%, not about the percentage improvement. Percentage improvement is our milestones in terms of getting to the global picture. So the question becomes, what's the potential of St. Lucia? Who's really actually sat down and, and tried to figure that out? And so without getting into a lot of scientific numbers, we said, okay, um, St. Lucia has a population of 170,000 people, and we have a gross domestic product GDP of about $1.7 billion. Um, Barbados, our neighbor, has a population of 270,000 people, and they have a GDP of just under $5 billion. Um, the Bahamas has a population of 370,000 people, 200,000 more than St. Lucia, and has a GDP of $12 billion. And when you look at the Bahamas, Nassau is 8 billion, and Paradise Island is 4 billion. Um, Aruba, 110,000 people, has a GDP of $3.5 billion. Uh, Malta um, has a population of 400,000 people and has a GDP of 12 billion. Uh, so the question becomes, where do we think that St. Lucia should be, given our population and the physical size of our country? And if we look at what our neighbors are currently doing, and we think that the minimum GDP that we should be at is around four, four and a half billion. But probably idealistically, we should be targeting six or seven billion dollars. So if we're now to triple the size of our economy, we said, okay, what would be the constraints? If you imagine just even doubling the size of our GDP, what would be the obvious constraints to preventing that from happening? So what would be the industries that we would be depending on to be able to have that kind of growth. Well, tourism, uh, agriculture, um, the IT sector, financial services, um, the what we call secondary home market, and which means that we need more arrivals. The current airport couldn't cope with any more arrivals. Physically, the plant couldn't, and there was nowhere place to park the planes. We, we'd run out of space. So, Certainly, if you're going to double or triple the size of your economy, at minimum, you would be doubling or tripling the number of arrivals that you currently have. So physically, the airport couldn't cope with that. Um, the road network. So imagine more people going to work, um, transporting more agricultural produce, uh, the level of activity you're taking. The road network 
wouldn't be able to cope with that. Uh, we have a problem right now. We uh, are sharing our cargo facility in Castries with the cruise industry. And so last year, we were in a lot of problems. We had a lot of ships waiting on the outside because there was no space for them to come in. And in fact, some ships started to go to Barbados and break down the cargo and send it on smaller boats to San Lucia. So it means we have to be able to solve that problem. Water, big problem. I mean, we were struggling to just keep pace with what the current demand is. Imagine if the economy tripled in size um, and there was this huge uh, increase in consumption of water. That would be a major problem. Um, the government, I mean, the government's struggling to deliver the services to people, getting your driver's license and getting your passports, getting your certificates, just your daily interaction with government. Government would struggle if the economy got bigger. So basically what we did is we went through that process and identified where all those constraints were and then started putting a program together. Now, we know that in order to be competitive on a global basis, that we have to focus on some critical things. Security, right? We've got to solve um, any forms of crime that are threatening to our citizens and their level of confidence and certainly towards anybody we're looking to invest in St. Lucia. The quality of our healthcare needs to be substantially changed. And whereas we're not offering tertiary level um, healthcare, whether that's going to be in Martinique, whether that's going to be in Miami, whether that's going to be somewhere else, or potentially is there an opportunity of creating tertiary level health facilities in St. Lucia, which would never be supported only by our local economy, but would have to be supported by what we call medical tourism. So we went through that process of identifying all those different things. And that's why when we campaigned, we talked about building a new St. Lucia. Now, you know, some people get nervous or concerned when a party, a political party, talks about a manifesto. I say, oh, this is politics. Well, the fact is a manifesto was voted on. It was a referendum. So the Labor Party presented their manifesto. We presented our manifesto. So the fact that we got the popular vote by over 60%, that that becomes now what the choice that St. Lucians have made. And it's so that is what drives that overall arching policy. And it's then now for us to meet with the civil service, the, the government, um, in order to be able to implement these different programs. But the clear thing is we had a very clear vision of what we wanted to be able to achieve that we believed was absolutely measurable. Um, and it was comprehensible, meaning this wasn't just about making building a solution for tourists. It's not just about building uh, a, a St. Lucia for farmers. It's about building a St. Lucia for everyone. It has to be able to meet every single individual's um, needs. And I, I think the last thing I can say on that is that what we found that there was in commonality is that no one problem had one solution. So let's take... And mm, everything is sort of interlinked. Everything is interlinked. So if you take crime as an example, just saying that the policemen are going to be um, more present isn't going to solve the problem. We have a thousand case backlog um, on criminal cases. A thousand cases. I mean, we're having to now look at bring in two judges only to deal with the backlog. That's thirteen and a half million dollars. Policemen didn't have a communication system. And police cars were, were un, in, in dire need of changing. The forensic lab was not working. We didn't have courthouses. Um, the uh, um, uh, police 911 and fire were not really operational. Um, so we, it required a, a holistic change um, to be able to solve the problem. We'll talk about that in a detail a little later on. But on the aspect of the economy, how do you rate yourself now? because uh, we're now into the eighth month of 2019. Mm -hmm. And how do you see this, the medium-term development plan working out in terms of being able to generate jobs? Um, we have seen a decline in that jobless rate. Uh, just the bread and butter issues for St. Lucians, um, businesses, the sort of, do you, find yourself being satisfied that there's buoyancy in the economy right now? Um, that's all a very difficult question for a politician to answer. Um, uh, I am, I am 
heartened by the fact that the policies that we've implemented have been yielding the results that they have been. So in the absence of any major capital projects, construction projects, that we've seen government revenue increase, um, and we're seeing the economy grow, and we're seeing unemployment coming down. So once now the physical projects start, that's gonna take it to the next level. So I am very comfortable as to where we are and the strategies that we have um, uh, implemented. Uh, where I am not happy is because it can't happen fast enough. So anytime that you know that people continue to suffer in this country uh, is worrisome to me. And uh, I know how difficult it is for some people in this country. I mean, so we'll get talking about, about health care. You know, there's over 40,000 people that really don't have access to health care in this country. So even though that there is a Victoria or there are doctors, they just can't afford to go. And you know, St. Lucians, um, a lot of them, uh, if they owe $200 to Victoria, that's enough to deter them from going because they feel bad about going. So the new system that we're going to be introducing, which will be giving in health care insurance to those 40,000 people, is going to be a fundamental change in their life. Do you believe that for what do we not understand about investment and how to attract investment? Because uh, there's a concern that perhaps the government is the, the public, the, the economy being driven simply by public sector uh, projects, risk, the risk involved in that, inherent risk involved in that. What would you say to that concern? Um, it's an ideology and a philosophy, and I think that that's really a, a fundamental difference between the two political parties. And how I describe it, as I describe it, that um, we are a government that believes that we must earn our revenue, and I think that the Labour Party believed that it was entitled. So meaning that if there was insufficient monies available through taxation to pay for the things that we need to invest in, um, the Labour Party's response historically has been to increase taxes. So that be, that, that's what we call a form of entitlement. Whereas we believe in the United Workers Party that we need to earn it. So when I see that we're not earning enough taxes, what it says to me is that there's some structural problems in the economy. There's something that's constraining the economy from being able to grow, which requires government to change policies or to fix something. So when we came in, we genuinely believed that the country was being overtaxed. So it means that for every percentage increase in tax that was happening, you were not getting a percentage or higher of revenue. In fact, you were getting less. So for instance, when the VAT rate went from zero to 15%, parallel to that, corporate taxes dropped from 95 million to 55 million. Why? Because a lot of small businesses were, got squeezed out. A person who had a hairdressing salon all of a sudden having to pay 15% VAT on their rental rate. And that happened right away. Got to the point where they couldn't afford to pay their rent. And if they couldn't afford to pay their rent, they couldn't afford to keep their business going, they moved into their home. And so the people that they had employed, they lost their jobs. And so a small company that was paying some corporate tax now was paying nothing. So we came in and we lowered the VAT rate. And what happened is that we lost nothing on the VAT revenue but now corporate tax went from $70 million to $95 million. And total government revenues went from $950 million to $1.2 billion. So that's a great example of, of, of the expectations. And we think that the ease of doing business, we must be concerned about. How long does it take to open up a company? How long does it take people to process their applications? Um, and when when laws are not very clear and have multiple of the, of, of the definitions, and depending on who you go to, they, they tell you what they feel it is, and then years later somebody says, well, that was the wrong interpretation. These are aggravating things, which reduces people's confidence to want to be able to do business in St. Lucia. So for instance, um, one of the new things that we introduced is the Headquarters Act, which allows foreign companies, or even local companies, to open up a headquarters in St. Lucia. Um, they pay no corporate tax, there's no work permits, and you can bring anybody from anywhere, and whoever's working, whether they're St. Lucian or foreign, don't pay any income tax. 
So we have now almost nine companies operating in St. Lucia under that. So that's right now, I think it's something like 350 jobs that would not have existed in St. Lucia and are now in St. Lucia. But as a consequence of it, take um, the Johnson's building up at Rodney Bay. For years, that building was empty. By introducing the Headquarters Act and some changes that we made to the fiscal, it's full. So these are the things that are very important in terms of being able to drive your economy. Are you meeting your capacity? Are you improving the productivity? And are you improving your um, overall efficiency? So Sir Arthur Lewis College, the programs that we're turning out there, are the kids that we're turning out, are they immediately making an impact wherever they're going to work? Government must continuously ask the effectiveness of its programs, otherwise it's just, it's just an expenditure. And so if it's not, and then business people are having to retrain those people, it's lost time and lost effort. And, and we're not achieving uh, the support that we need to be able to grow our economy. On the public sector, and just my final question to you on this, the debt to GDP ratio, mm -hmm. the concern is not just from St. Lucians, but you know, we've always had the sort of uh, caution flags coming from the international um, financial institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth. Where do we stand now and how conscious are you as Minister for Finance about St. Lucia's debt to GDP ratio? I have no choice but to be conscious of it because it's something that, that's unfortunately used as a major um, statistic. Uh, so, so when we came into government, the debt to GDP was 69%. As we speak today, it's 64.5%. So we're continuously seeing that number being declined. Um, the naysayers um, want to suggest that because we are financing the airport, as an example, through the mechanism that we are, that that's going to increase the overall debt to GDP. And th there really is two answers to that question. So um, one, it is the more important ratio is what percentage of your revenue is going to finance debt. That's the most important. Can you afford the debt that you have? So what we have done as a government is any new debt that we've taken on, we've made sure that we have a new revenue stream. So we're not taking any of the existing. So the $1.2 billion in additional tax monies that we've generated, none of that is going to pay for the airport or for the roads. We introduced an airport tax, which we went from $25 to, to $98, and we introduced a gas tax. Those two new revenue streams are what are being used now to fund most of the new debt that we're taking on. So there is no fiscal pressure on my part. The next thing I have to ask is, if in fact I don't invest in the airport because we're scared of taking on the debt, right? can the economy grow? And I think the answer is very clear, it cannot. Because if I don't have a new airport terminal, I can't get new airlift. If I can't get new airlift, then I'm not going to get people to build any new hotel rooms. So it's the chicken and an egg. Now, the argument that the Labour Party is making with regards to the PPP. So the IMF, had not the IMF, the IFC, had recommended to St. Lucia that what we do is we make what we call an SPV, a special purpose vehicle at the airport. And the way that that would work is the government would lease the airport facility to a third party and that they would be in complete control of the revenue as well as um, uh, all the decisions that are being made at the airport uh, so that it's independent of the government of St. Lucia. But the money to pay for the debt was still coming from the airport tax. So the condition of doing that was that the government was going to increase the airport tax to $55 and they were arguing that it should be $60. So it's our revenue. So the point that we were making is, is that when we looked at the numbers, that if you were, had 400,000 arrivals today and you have 2,000 new rooms coming on, you have potentially a cruise ship home porting facility coming on, let's say at minimum it increases by 100,000, although those numbers would suggest it's going to increase substantially more. I can, or we can pay for the debt in less than 10 years. Why would I continue to give a third party the $60 per head for 30 years? And what are they going to do with all that money? Whereas we're saying we have to build a north-south highway, 
there's more infrastructure that we have to build. So let's get the airport paid for, use the money for the next 20 years to be able to now pay for all these different things. I can get away with that because I've shown the IMF and I've shown the World Bank that this is not affecting my day-to-day um, -day operations because this revenue is being lockboxed. We have insurances in place if there's any downfalls. We have provisions in our uh, uh, loan agreements that if in fact that there is a natural catastrophe or a force majeure, that we don't have to pay the debt until we're back up on our feet again. So all those provisions have been put in place in order to be able to protect us. So uh, debt to GDP is a very important number uh, in the world globally, but I think that the more important number is your um, ratio, your debt ratio, which is the amount of debt that you have, your payments of your debt relative to your income. And we're continuing to see that number fall well below the prudent level. So there is, uh, I can't say ever no hope, but the reality is St. Lucia is in not any financial danger at this point. All of the new debt we've been taking on is more than co compensated in the numbers we have. So for instance, even the $35 that we've put into the lockbox is 20% more than we need to be able to finance the loan. Plus, we've got the provisions in the loans to protect us in case of natural disaster. So uh, we have to grow this economy. We must grow this economy responsibly. I think that the concern that the World Bank and the IMF had when my government came into office and some of our policies was really, they felt that if we dropped the VAT rate, that we would have lost $55 million. They felt that if we increased the airport tax, we would have reduced the number of arrivals that we had. And they felt that if we introduced a gas tax, we would have created inflation. So for the first year, um, my government agreed not to spend any of the additional income just in case they were right. So what happened? So the VAT revenue was supposed to have dropped to f by 55, only dropped by 15. And by the second year, we were already at the level where we were. So there was no impact on that. The second one was that the uh, tourism arrivals would have gone down. Well, we had a record year of arrivals and we've continued to see those arrivals numbers grow because as we said to them, when people are buying a hotel package to come to St. Lucia, they're not buying an airline ticket. So it's your hotel stay, your tours, everything are in one price. So increasing it by $75 was gonna be no impact. And furthermore, the average airport tax in the region was $100. And St. Lucia was at $25. And we were seeing no benefit. It means that that extra $75 is actually going to the bottom line of the airlines, not necessarily to us or being passed on to the tourist. And then the third one was that um, we'd have seen inflation. Well, the fact that you brought down the VAT rate countered the, uh, uh, any, any potential of inflation by the gas tax. So once they saw that, then everybody was very, very good, and we've now proceeded um, to be able to allocate those funds to stimulate the necessary infrastructure we need. You brought up the PPP, and the follow-up to that is, what makes St. Lucia's situation different to that of, say, Jamaica, where it has gone full throttle with the PPP on its airport development? Very, I mean, I was in Jamaica, um, as you remember, with Air Jamaica, and I was there at the time. And Jamaica's debt to GDP mm, was about 150%. So Jamaica was not in a position to take on any of the debt. Barbados, which was at 170%, is not in a position to have taken on. Now, imagine a couple of years ago when they, they were at 100%, they didn't do it through a PPP. They did the expansion of the airport themselves. It's only now that they've, they realize they made a mistake and that they did, didn't put jetways in. So to go and put the jetways in now is a significant capital investment they're going to have to make. And there's no way with the current debt to GDP that they have, they can do that. So in the case of St. Lucia, our debt to GDP is 64%. The prudent level is 60%. So we're in a much better position um, to be able to do that. And the monies and the savings to the state by doing it the way that we're doing it is uh, huge. As I said to you, I mean, we're talking about um, almost $600 million in 30 years, assuming that we only go to 500,000 passengers. If you go past 500,000 passengers, it's even more than that, of monies that now would be collected by the state and could be applied to 
investing in our infrastructure versus that that money is going into a third party. That third party person exclusively could make the decision as to how they were going to spend that money. Mr. Prime Minister, you did actually give us a, a good rundown as to how diverse the economy is and some of the areas that are needed and some of the key areas to sustain the economy, um, including GDP growth and VAT and the, its impact and the reduction of the national debt. But we also know that a useful partner is the private sector. If you can speak a bit on the support the government is going to be lending to or continues to lend to the private sector to enable the economy to continue to, to really flourish and realize the sort of growth that you're looking for? Um, our involvement with the private sector is multitude. So first of all, by running a good country, by making your macro accounts, so things like your debt to GDP, your debt ratio um, financing, your overall unemployment rate, um, improving your credit rating, all those things automatically make it easier for the private sector to be able to do business. Um, the new e-government that we want to be able to introduce um, will significantly improve the ability of our countries to be competitive. Um, we had promised in our manifesto that we were going to put $10 million into SLDB. We've put 20, and we're currently trying to make sure that some of the monies that were going into the economic fund, that those monies will be able to also go into St. Lucia Development Bank to be used for home mortgages and for equity uh, financing. So on a fiscal basis, those are the kinds of things that we're doing and by lowering taxes. So lowering the VAT rate from 15% uh, to 12.5%. We've just introduced a new personal income tax. So it means that we've now increased the threshold that where people need to pay personal income tax, which was previously at $18,000. Now it's gonna go to $24,000. Now that's huge because that means that the pressure to put an increase in wages on becomes less because people are automatically seeing that their wage, um, their net wage has actually gone up. We're in the process of reviewing our corporate income tax. So the idea is to harmonize our corporate tax and to bring our corporate tax rate down closer to 15% than the 30% it currently is at. The other big thing that we're doing is where government has assets that we don't have the capital to be able to develop those assets, we're trying to work with the private sector. So for instance, housing. The government is going in and uh, putting land into a company, allowing um, monies to be borrowed by a, a contractor to do the subdivisions, put in all the infrastructure, sell the lots, and then once he's sold the lots, then government gets paid back for the land. So that means the developer doesn't have to buy the land, um, that he's saving on his taxes that he's is paying on the land, and meanwhile, the population is benefiting from more affordable housing. Because if I had to now go and borrow the money myself, it now means my debt to GDP ratio goes up. It starts constraining the ability of me to be able to, to pay for my current financing. So these are the kinds of partnerships we're looking at. Castries redevelopment, you know, fixing up the water problems in Castries, the sewage problem. We're still dumping raw sewage into Port Castries, the utilities underground making more clear space. So let's look as an example, Castries Market. You know, Castries Market will become, I promise you, the number one attraction in St. Lucia by the investment that we're going to be making, which is about 10 million to 12 million US dollars we're investing. Um, for those who have traveled and have gone to a, a market called Burroughs Market in London, it's very similar to what we're going to be trying to do here. And it's also to understand that the vendor is not the artisan. So how can we now improve the quality of our artisans, get the vendors to actually be free franchisees? So I would love to see where the vendors have different uniforms and like they're representing different businesses. So when I go to Miami to a mall, in the middle of the mall, there are all these like little kiosks. That's what we're trying to create with our vendors. So now you have more business people. So it means that they can have a product, they know what the price is going to be, they're given a uniform, the, the stall is designed for them, they're told what the pricing is going to be, and more importantly, they're told about selling the product. So it means that they're adding value to the sale. You know, you remember me from my days of director yeah. of tourism, and I used to lament what I used to call the mercy purchase, right? So when our vendors would sit there and look all sad, and the person would really be buying it, not because they wanted the product, but because they're trying to help. Nobody leaves that transaction satisfied. Okay, the customer is going, you know, 
I don't want everyone to come back to this place because I really don't like seeing this level of poverty. The person who sold it hasn't added any value. And I know that in their heart of heart, they, they, they know they have not done it. I mean, they're obviously grateful for the money, but they're not happy or feel good about themselves that the person has left with any level of satisfaction. So the next one really is office spaces. Um, so take the Dyer Mall. We're going to be announcing a deal with the Dyer Mall very soon where we're doing a joint venture with a, with a person where they will purchase the ground floor of the building. We will own the next two floors, but the developer now will fix up those two floors. So here's a building. How many people is it employing? Zero. How many taxes, dollars are being generated on a daily basis from that location? Zero. How many solutions are having an, an opportunity to be able to enhance their life? Zero. But here is where we can now get a private sector person to put the money onto the table, use government's tax incentives um, in order to be able to cause the development to be able to take place. Obviously, we do that on a regular basis with the manufacturers, and so we're trying very hard to be able to grow that industry. The big one really has been the introduction of NAPS, the National Apprenticeship Program. So the fundamental difference between NAPS and NICE, um, same amount of money, the difference is instead of NAPS employing people and paying $1,500 per person indefinitely and a job that would only exist if NICE was paying for it, in the case of NAPS, we're paying $500 for 18 months. And the, the private sector person is paying the remaining amount of money. And then after 18 months, that job is completely taken over by the private sector person. So, Ojo is a great example where they came in. That technology didn't exist here. In fact, it didn't exist in the Caribbean. Nobody had opened up an artificial intelligence um, operation in the Caribbean. And we were the first. And that they have gone from 26 kids. Today, I think they're close to 400. And we're hoping that by next summer, they'll be close to 700. But as we currently speak, that company by itself is paying almost $500,000 a fortnight in salaries. That's $500,000 that didn't exist in the South. That's a million dollars a month. That's $12 million a year in salaries. Plus there's over eight bus companies that are now providing the bus transportation because it runs a, a shift system three times a day. It has its own kitchen and which they've adopted now farmers. So these are businesses that didn't exist. So government recognizes that we can help reduce the cost of getting businesses in, help them in the first couple of years of reducing the risk and, and, and making a success of it, but then it becomes win-win all around. After 18 months, the government says you want your own. Yeah, the, the 18 months only applied to the first uh, 150 people, and then everybody else after that it applies for one year. Um, and in the first instance, it was $1,000 for the first six months and $500 thereafter. And now it's only $500 a month afterwards. We also opened up a second company with them in which we did the same deal. Um, and that's if they can bring other companies now also to invest. And we're very close to announcing some, some new investors coming in to actually. So we, we've seen one of the fastest growth areas in terms of employment, um, tourism has done well, but the fastest growing has really been in the IT sector. So uh, KM2 have had a substantial increase. There's two other operations up in the Rodney Bay area that have continued to expand. Um, and we've also seen Ojo expanding and the Invest um, has now done uh, a mission where they had six major companies coming down. And so mm -hmm. two of those companies are about to announce their expansion into St. Lucia. We believe that the Dyer Mall, that we're going to be able to dedicate almost 70,000 square feet to the call centers. Okay. Now in the, the remaining time that we have, uh, let's uh, look at the security aspect. Because mm -hmm. all of this investment will be for naught if safety is not under control. Uh, you've announced that the CCTV program uh, is is moving afoot. We've, you've announced something in the region of $11 million of an investment mm -hmm. to uh, secure those cameras, um, the installation, and for the command center as well. So give us an update as to where we're at, and are we already at the implementation phase for that? Are we actionized with that? 
you know, for security reasons, we can't say exactly where they are located, but is it up and running? If not, when? The CCTV cameras are already up and running. Um, the command center is up and running. Um, there was one final glitch, which is to get Flow and Digicel to interface. No surprise. Um, but that should be done by this week. So it means that when you call 911 and your call comes in, it will, act, it will locate where that call is coming from. And the cameras that are in that area would be activated. So that means the person who is answering the phone is actually going to be given a lot more information than they've ever had before. Uh, several accidents have taken place on the uh, castries Grosley Highway, and we're now able to go and look at the cameras. Um, what's being reported back to me is people who have been having accidents and you know everybody's, it's always the other person's fault. Once they show the people the video, then claims are being settled much quicker. And we had an incident a uh, couple of weeks back where somebody was by the um, uh, VG roundabout and uh, was involved in an accident and they died. And the claim was is that the uh, car next to them had hit him. So once we had reviewed the cameras, we found that that was not the case. In fact, the person had an attack um, when he was in the car. So the accident was entirely caused by himself, unfortunately. We've had incidences in terms of uh, drug interdictions. And so we're able to follow people. But I want to say to you that the CCT cameras, as well as the communication systems that the policemen had, because when we came in, policemen were communicating on their own phones. So they had to have their own cell phone, they were paying for their own time, and then if they were apprehending somebody, they would have to call 911 like the rest of us in order to be able to communicate. All the vehicles now have the VHF units in it. Um, the handheld units are now being distributed, as well as with the firemen, the waterproof, and the marine police, all waterproof uh, uh, equipment. That's going to go a long ways in being able to help. We have 40 um, SPCs that are coming on board within the next two weeks. Uh, and they are being allocated to be doing more foot patrols in hotspots. We recognize that hotspots rotate. So we look at statistics on a weekly basis to be able to make that level of determination. The court backlog. So physically the court space, um, as well as the access and number of judges that we currently have. Um, if, in fact, the forensic lab, the police collection of evidence, CCT cameras, are working better, it means that we go to the cases much more prepared. And we've seen very clearly that when you have that kind of evidence, people plead guilty much quicker, and therefore the, server, the system works much, much, much better. We also believe that we now need to look at um, the Bordelais facility. We now have a new parole board in place. Um, I'm very grateful to my wife because she raised a fair amount of money and was able to give some facilities at, at Bordelais. And, and I think that we, we as solutions have to change our attitude. Yes, they committed a crime. But the goal has to be that we can reform as many of them as possible. And as a layman, not difficult to figure out. Do we genuinely believe that the way that Bordley is currently designed and is operating, that people have a fair chance of being reformed? And I don't think it's a difficult question to be able to answer. And so one of the things we are definitely looking at is a different penal system that gives everybody a greater opportunity to be reformed. We're seeing that the vast majority of people who are in Bordelais um, are illiterate so, and don't have a skill set. So imagine somebody who's caught for something went into a completely different facility that was actually designed more like a house and a school. And yes, they're, they're incarcerated, but the fact is, is that they're being reformed from the day they get there and being taught how to become uh, productive parts of our workforce and we're seeing and our society. That because in the last few years, we've had a number of the inmates being successful at the CXC level. So that is encouraging. It's encouraging. And, and what encourages me, that's in the current environment, which is very much a penal colony. And so therefore, um, I think that that's something that we have to you know, really look at. And then we've said, OK, how do we get to the source of the problem? And you know, we've had this long discussion. And I, I feel very disheartened because you know, communication is a very difficult thing. 
And some, some issues I'm, are very emotional. And I, and I clearly see that some statements I've made, particularly about single mothers, have been made to be interpreted very differently than what my intention was. I have great admiration, I've always had great admiration for single mothers, um, particularly ones that um, have a job and are creating an environment for their children, uh, despite the fact that they're the only person there. What I was concerned about and what I am passionate about is younger girls under the age of 18 who are finding themselves in a difficult situation and there isn't enough support from the state to help. And what's making it worse is that we're into the third generation of that. And we all know it's very difficult for them to get out of that. And we also know statistically that the majority of criminals are coming from people who, are, who have that had background. It doesn't make them bad people. That's the point I'm trying to make. It just I'm means that the circumstances that they're in And we, as terrible. citizens of this country, cannot walk away from it. And I think it's a universal thing because we've seen reports from the uh, psychologists, world-renowned psychologists, uh, people, sociologists have indicated, and even a recent study right here from Baudelaire did indicate that for a number of the inmates, a vast number of the inmates, that they're coming from single parent households. So you know, I, I met with um, a person, I don't want to mention the person, but they, they work in a program to deal with um, wayward boys. And the stories of hearing kids who have never been told that they're loved, ever, right? And that you grow up in an atmosphere where you see your mother toiling and being taken advantage of. How do you grow up with any level of empathy in your heart, right? And what I want to say to solutions is we cannot run away from this. This will come back to us. And all of us have to play the part. I, I, I readily admit the state does not have enough resources. I've said that. How can we have, what, 12 or 14 um, social workers for the whole country? Right? We need in, in excess of 40 to 50 social workers to deal with the problems we have. And, and maybe that may not even be enough. So in the absence of that, let's not let time go by. If you are in a neighborhood and you see people who are suffering like that, reach out. That's been the solution way, right? Help these people. Let's not get into the blame game as to how they found themselves in that position. They are in that position. Now I've seen young ladies who've had a child under the age of 15 and either the single mother or the parents step in either adopt directly or support that child, but that girl is made to go back to school. And when you speak to these, these young ladies later in life, that was sufficiently to, enough to scare them. And they really get on the straight and narrow at that point. But the vast majority are not benefiting from that level of support. And, and we as a country, if we're going to reach our full potential, must deal with that. And the point here is, is that crime is not just about police presence. It's not just about the judicial system. It's not just about the overall level of equipment. It is about our morality. It's about who we are as a people. And that's why this sports program that we're doing is so critical. And I'm saying I'd rather see kids join clubs than instead of joining gangs. I mean, we were two days ago where the Windward kids came back from, from a very successful tour. Uh, the enthusiasm, the camaraderie that sports create was palatable. I've been part of it myself. It is irreplaceable what this can do. And by improving the standard of sports, the competitiveness of sports, and also arts, in our communities will go a long ways in distracting people from the wrong direction and put people more in the right direction. And the values um, and the discipline that they learn at that younger age carries through. And that's what I was saying. It doesn't matter if you come last in the race. Did you do your best? So if you participated in the marathon, you came last, but you broke your own personal best time, you won. Because I know for you to have broken your personal best time required commitment and required a discipline. Everybody is at different standards. But if you have that attitude of being a winner and wanting to push yourself 
and everybody has that, then this country will progress. And the mentality takes you through to the rest of your life. Correct. We want to be able to move on to the health sector. We want to give it some due time. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a break now. And when we come back, the health sector in focus. Bon la mer, c'est un bon place pour nous un bon temps, mais c'est faux qu'on ait un tsunami. Sous bon la mer, qu'on sentit qu'il y a un fond de l'air pire. Baissé, couvert par vous, et espéré de semblant de l'air de bout, et couvert de l'air de bout. Sous bon well, la mer, qu'on a witché l'air, qu'on a quitté le lance-là vite. Couvert de l'air de bout. Sous bon la mer, qu'on a fait un tout le désordre. Couvert de l'air de bout. Si vous n'avez pas de ces signes, vous pouvez monter plus haut que vous avez de monde et le troisième étage en caille et espérer les autorités annoncer que ça descend. Coué, 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 monter plus haut. Apprendre les signes de tsunami. La PEPA n'est pas assez temps pour annoncer un tsunami qui a approché. C'est une commission par le groupe Management des Arts bien fort et Place Management des Arts en Saint-Lucie et financée par l'Agence pour le Développement International Amérique, Bureau Assistance des Arts de l'autre pays. What is money laundering? Money laundering is the concealment of the origins of illegally obtained money, typically by means of transfers involving financial institutions or legitimate businesses. There are three steps in the process of money laundering. One, placement. This is the movement of illegitimately obtained cash from its source into circulation through financial institutions. Two, Layering. This is the act of concealing the source of that money using a series of complex transactions and bookkeeping tricks. 3. Integration. This is the movement of previously laundered money into the economy, mainly through the financial institutions, and thus such monies appear to be normal business earnings. What is terrorist financing? Terrorist financing provides funds for terrorist activity. It may involve funds raised from legitimate sources such as donations, profits from businesses and charitable organizations, as well as from criminal sources such as the drug trade, the smuggling of weapons, fraud, kidnapping and extortion. There is an interrelation between terrorist financing and proliferation financing, which is the act of providing funds or financial services used in the acquisition, manufacture, or transport of weapons of mass destruction. How does money laundering and terrorist financing affect St. Lucia? St. Lucia can lose its reputation and international credibility. More violent and organized crimes and corruption. Penalties for the financial sector and loss of correspondent banking. St. Lucia will be evaluated in 2019 with respect to its money laundering and terrorist financing regimes. How can you help? Get involved. Learn about the threat that money laundering and terrorist financing pose to St. Lucia. And cooperate with financial and non-financial institutions when information is requested. Money laundering and terrorist financing are crimes with penalties of up to $1 million and imprisonment of up to 10 years or both. A message brought to you by the National Anti-Money Laundering Oversight Committee and the Attorney General's Chambers. Thanks for staying with us in focus in this final segment. We'll be looking at the healthcare sector and we'll also be giving you your opportunity to place your calls and also send us your messages and your questions to the Prime Minister. As the Prime Minister, the health sector is something that's really engaged your government since coming into office and maybe can give you the opportunity to look at a number of areas that I will give you the latitude to go into. The St. Jude situation in terms of the hospital and getting the facility back in operation, primary healthcare upgrades, 
and focuses on a Sufre and then the hospital and finally the transition to the OKEU. You know, healthcare um, was one of the pillars that we spoke about in my manifesto. We talked about a, a fo a affordable quality healthcare. And, and we, we understood in opposition when we saw what was going on that the government was struggling to find the resources to be able to open up OKEU, clearly. Because when you saw the quality of the facilities at Victoria and around the island, nobody would rightfully want to see um, that continue. And so the fact that the government couldn't move into OKU told me um, before we got in that it was a problem. And when we got in, I didn't realize how big of a problem. The problem that they'd had was one, that you were gonna have less beds at OKU. And so therefore, the requirement was for us to uh, upgrade the primary health care facilities. And that no work and no money had been allocated to be able to do that. Um, the second problem is as I indicated, is the vast majority of people cannot afford to get health care. So the current system that we have where the money was being allocated on a quarterly basis to Victoria and that Victoria's um, operations were being supervised and managed by the government is just a no-no. I mean, when, you, when we went physically in a walk there, basic things that if there was a proper management system in place would, would, would not be there. Um, how we registered the people. The blood bank database was on a DOS system. DOS, I mean, I think it's probably even before your time, Melissa, right? Um, the old equipment that had not been moved because you had to go into a special department at government. So you'd see a new condenser from an, an, an air conditioner right next to an old condenser. You go into the lab and half of the equipment in there is not working. But, and that creates a pervasive attitude of, 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 of non-excellence. And so I have to say to you that the staff did an admirable job when it came to caring and empathy, but they were not being supported by the infrastructure in that particular area. So there was no way that we could have moved into OKEU without a radical change towards how we're gonna manage it. So if you look at St. Jude's as an example, even though it's in a stadium, what we call a non-purpose built facility, it actually runs operationally a better operation. So for instance, when you go to St. Jude's they, and you're, you're insured, they collect the money. Victoria doesn't, right? And the whole mechanism to prescriptions, to your pharmacy, everything is interconnected. And, and the reason for that is because St. Jude's benefited from Mercy Hospital in 2001 that came down and put together their operating procedures. So we knew that we had to be able to have a proper operating procedure at OKU. We had to solve the problem at the primary health level, and then here becomes the big one, is that the estimates were that we would go from uh, $35 million operating cost at Victoria to a $70 million operating cost at OKU. And I don't know sort of I believe that number because I know the $35 million at, at, at Victoria is grossly inadequate based on what I'm seeing, right? You're going into a fully air conditioned facility, um, you're doing things that you've not done before. And then the big one that terrified me, I have to tell you on a personal basis, was going from what I call a mechanical system to an electronic system. So the bed was a crank bed at Victoria, you're now going to an electrical bed. When a crank bed breaks, it's very easy to get somebody to go and fix it. When that electronic bed, you can't bang it, it's not gonna move. So what you have to do is your preventive maintenance becomes even more critical in that regard. So, We have a call on the line. We want to say good afternoon to that caller. Thank you so much. You are in focus. You have a question for the Prime Minister? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. Good afternoon, sir. Let me first um, thank you for the opportunity um, you, you take from your ambitious schedule to educate um, the populace about the uh, performances of the government. Um, I, I listen to you um, intensively, and I appreciate it, <laughs> and some calling. I mean, um, you've given a, a very extensive um, view on the 
social well-being improvement of, and also the economic improvement of the country at large. And um, I, I feel that um, I, as, as a resident in the South of the country, and I know you put a lot of emphasis in the development, improved development of the South of the country, um, there are many indicators that myself and other people, residents in the South, can see that um, there is economic improvement. Um, some of which is, um, well, you go to the banks now in Beaufort and, you know, even Schwozel and these areas, and um, the lines are so huge. So that, tells, that should tell people that um, there is economic growth in the country. The amount of traffic in the south now um, is realized. It means that people have extra money in the pockets. I also always um, tell the minibus drivers in Beaufort, but look at, there's a van that sells um, Creole bread that comes there on an afternoon. And um, when the Labour Party was in power, this van used to come with just one basket of bread and sell, and sometimes they, they go with balance of bread. Today, Mr. Prime Minister, this van comes there with um, three baskets at one time, and they make sometimes two to four trips in the day. So I keep telling them, look, this is, this is economic growth. It shows that people have extra money in their pocket to spend on bread and other things. You understand? So leave it not alone. It's congratulations to you and, your, and, and the government. Um, there is also on the focus that I, I should say the government should place on an area of um, creative industry sector. Uh, and this is the sector where I belong to. Um, the, this sector, um, if the government places a little bit more focus on it, I mean, um, there are people who realize um, children who go to the secondary schools, um, a lot of them drop out of school. I believe that that sector can be used to facilitate those kids, provide a little bit of um, training for them, and um, get them into that sector, and um, we'll get them out of the streets. So. Um, in that saying, I applaud the government um, on last that, question and I hope that the, um, the government will, industry, will see uh, uh, Like that tourism, happening. it creates so many um, linkages. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is this whole um, uh, club system that we're creating. And I use the example um, of the aquatic center, um, where you have one facility and there are eight clubs that have primary level and secondary level students. So this is what we're going to be emulating in all of the constituencies. So these new sporting facilities, which is being started with Sue Freire, is to make that happen. And part of that is also the arts. So that if I'm a kid after school, I go back to my community and part of my club, my club will have um, sporting programs, but it will also have uh, creative arts, um, drama, uh, creative writing, and film. I mean, my iPhone can produce songs um, I could make a movie from my iPhone, so the technology is there. So there's nothing that's limiting the ability for us to capture our creativity. And if you take, you know, one of my favorite groups, Denry Segment, you really have to um, put your hat up to these kids. And I remember uh, during the campaign, uh, leading up to the campaign, walking through Denry and seeing these little studios that these guys had done, when they took mattresses, and they had their creative area out back and they would go in and cut their song right away. Uh, the technology is there to allow kids to express themselves and what we need to do is to continue to do that. So one of the big changes we've made, and I know that you, Lisa, would, would really uh, appreciate this, CDF's role is not to do events. <laughs> CDF's role is to continuously put on training programs to improve the quality the of our arts. Is. Correct. So uh, songwriting, lyrics, um, stage presentations, all of those things. So even now when we see the, the reintroduction of Steel Pan, is that they're going around and making sure that Pan is being now taught at all the different school levels. And, but it's, it's a, a, a habit is a difficult thing to break. Um, and I know they've spoken to Danny and the board and they're, they, they can be involved in the events, but they can't be driving the events. Their job was not to put on Carnival. We have another yeah, call on. online just before that yes. point. Yes. What's Hello, your question for the Prime Minister? Yeah, it's, it's me again. I got caught off. Um, I wanted to finish uh, my point by saying to the Prime Minister, because I belong to a, a political party, um, 
I, I think, I believe that... Um, okay, while we await the, the call to come through, uh, we do have a question coming off Facebook. Um, hi, Jody. Thank you so much for watching. And her question is, with an aim to build a new St. Lucia that can last uh, changes that can last changes in administrations, what is the government's plan to reform the constitution and by extension reform our systems of local government and other core democratic institutions? Um, great question. I mean, we, we, we had a retreat this week on, on local government. Local government yes. I'm a big believer in local government. I believe that my statement is online, so I would, su I would really strongly suggest to um, Jody yeah. that she maybe go on my Facebook um, uh, site. I think that some of the news channels are also um, had covered it. I'm a big believer in local government. I think that effective government can only be done at a local level. Um, and with regards to constitutional changes, they require two-thirds majority. Um, I've attempted on some, uh, some levels to be able to get the opposition to participate with us. That's been very difficult. But I'm also going to say to Jody that when I went around, there's still too many solutions that are struggling and aren't focusing on anything about constitution. They're focused on next meal, getting my kids to school, school books and stuff like that. And I think that the unemployment rate is a target, meaning it's moving in the right direction. Uh, getting more money in people's hands, improving our social network uh, uh, to be able to help people. And when we can start now getting more people participating and having confidence in the government. I mean, I have to tell you, when I came in, um, people's confidence in government and politicians is probably at an all-time low. But the idea, but for the um, constitution reform has been under cards for quite some time now. Isn't that part of restoring the public's confidence, the citizenry's confidence in government if we can um, hold to that? But before we continue with that point, we want to say thank you so much, Kola. What's your question for the Prime Minister? Um, first and foremost, I just want to applaud the Prime Minister and his government for the good work they have been doing so far. Um, at this, we have been seeing you open the door, okay, I can hear. a lot of things happening in the country. Okay. Um, but I want to know realistically, what is it that the Lucia I expect um, the government do for the rest of the tenure um, to ensure that the government will retain um, governance um, come the next general election. So I think if I, we had a little yeah. difficulty hearing, but I think if I got the gist of what the caller is asking, is for the government to remain or your plans for ensuring that the the plans and policies that you've stated in a manifesto which has now become government policy adhering to that so i have a confession the confession is, is that um, we as a party made a decision that we were not going to take the easy road um, and that we were going to make decisions that would take 10, 15 years to be able to see it to its full fruition. Now, the danger in doing that is that when you are being reelected every five years, that there has to be enough done that people still have confidence in. But in not doing that means you're cutting um, the, the value and the opportunities of the people of St. Lucia short. Because if you're going to make decisions that are always going to be just short term, very difficult. Um, I am confident from what I've been seeing, and I told everyone, you know, first hundred days and then first year and then second year. It takes three years of your out there campaigning, implementing for things to start seeing so people can visibly see. So SUFER is a great example. You know, the process in SUFER started after Hurricane Tomas. You know, we put together a very clear plan. We lost the elections. Unfortunately, the Labour Party um, either did not continue some of the work or did not have a plan themselves as to what they were going to do. And five years has passed by. We came back in and we, we started exactly where we left it off. And it's taken three years. And now people, uh, Hummingbird Beach, um, Old Trafford, the Square, very soon the um, stadium, 
the new hospital, the roads. It takes all those things coming together for then people to see the, the full outcome. But there's sufficiently, a sufficient number of things that have taken place that people are now becoming very enthusiastic. The same thing will happen in Anseray, the same thing will happen in Rodney Bay, once the Castries market. The Castries market has been an eyesore for a long time. It's very difficult for people to envision it actually performing the way it's supposed to perform. And I guarantee you that when the work is completed, that people are going to go, wow, right? Just talking about completion, everybody's anxious for the OKEU, for mm -hmm. its opening. We've seen the transition in happening. We've seen services moving from the Victoria Hospital to the OKAU. Mm -hmm. Where are we at right now in advancing completion of that process and the operationization of OKAU? Because now we can see it's relatively open, but to operationalize it now, when and how are we going to see this happen? So we have a team um, led, headed up by um, Dr. Lisa Charles. Um, and we've uh, just about hopefully finalizing the contract to have a, 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 a company help us in wherever the shortcomings are going to be, particularly on the administrative side. Um, one of the problems that we had in that location was that it had not been used for so long that the electrical breakers were faulting and we had to get new ones made, so those have now been put in. And so the, the, answer, the short answer to your question is that we're hoping that by October 15th that we'll be fully operational at OKEU. That's October this year. October this year. Right. We have a call online. Hello, good, Hello, good afternoon. Um, my, good afternoon, panel. My question is for the Prime Minister. Um, I have a little, I'm a supporter of your but I have a little issue with the local government, especially the grass on the sides of the road. What are you planning on doing for in this way for for this time, the rainy season, to try and assist people? Because the grass is really over the road and it's getting it's bit it's a bit ridiculous. Thank you. That caller before you leave. We lost the call. Okay. So what we did is we, um, again, I'm, it's not about tit for tat, but just really from a comparison change in a policy. And the former government used to use the NICE program um, three times a year to do a stimulus and have people cut grass on the side of the road. So one, I, I have a difficulty that people who need support to cause them to go out and cut the grass on the side of the road to gain that support. There is no added value to the state. The grass grows back in three, in, in three weeks, right? So what we did is we took the clearing of the main roads and put it back into the Ministry of Infrastructure. We're spending about 3.4, 3.5 million dollars a year and giving out monthly contracts now along those roads. And so we have a, a consistent program in order for, uh, for the grass, because the, the call is 100% right. <laughs> this is critical, particularly during the rainy yeah, seasons. Sure. I can tell you that there are some habits that are hard to break in government. And going from uh, uh, the end of one year and starting up the new year, it's always the first quarter that seems to get squeezed out the most. And we're trying to fix that mechanism to, to prevent that from happening. But I would like to think that hopefully solutions, particularly in the last six to eight months, have seen a dramatic improvement in the cleaning of the sides of the roads throughout the length and the breadth. Local government will maintain the responsibility of cleaning the, side, the roads on the tertiary and the secondary level roads in their communities. The one exception, well, Castree City Council has always been doing that, but we're now empowering and, em and emboldening our local governments to be able to do that. So the cleaning of, of public facilities and sporting facilities and the sides of the roads in their communities will be is under local government, but the primary roads, the main roads, are being done by the Ministry of Infrastructure on a monthly basis. Mr. Prime Minister, um, we're going to wrap up soon. You didn't, when the call, start, call started coming in, you didn't really get a chance to wrap up on the St. June. Maybe that's a, a good note for us to end on, so if you can tell us a bit more yeah, about so your vision. On healthcare, we're finishing off with um, getting OKEU in. Critical to that and critical to healthcare is healthcare insurance. So the World Bank has, is supporting us in terms of designing a program 
We're working with NIC to hopefully be the administrator of the insurance. It means that every single St. Lucian now will have access to insurance. The 40,000 plus people who currently can't afford to go to healthcare it means they can go and see a doctor. If they get a prescription, they're going to get their medicine. If they need to get x-rays, everything literally up until tertiary level healthcare will be covered under the insurance. Now that's huge. So it means a person now um, who potentially is going to become diabetic or is potentially going to get a stroke because of high blood pressure, we can identify that earlier and it means that they're going to have access to medicine to be able to help them. Because the hope is that they'll be able to visit the doctor more. Because they can afford it. To get intervention. They, correct. It's cheaper for the state, I hate putting it that way, that it, to, to make sure that a person is having access to medicine than waiting for the person to need dialysis. Because you have a humanitarian problem and then the cost goes up considerably at that point. The final points of the insurance, have we been able to work that out? Has the government worked it out? So the, the, the paper will be presented to the government before the end of this year. It will be approved by cabinet by January. It will then be going to parliament and then we hope to be able to have it implemented starting in April 1st of next year. And so we're looking at how many, what is the proposal on the table for the models? Can you disclose what that is? Yeah. Are we looking at three different models to? We're looking at multitude laws. They're looking at all the costs. The key, the key comes down to cost. And I think that maybe the fundamental um, point here is government will continue to pay for the salaries of the nurses and the doctors at the, at the hospitals and the primary level services will continue to pay for the utilities. Really what we want the insurance to be able to cover is the medicines and the private doctor time as well as um, the radiology and all the services you're going to need. So it means that the premium ought to be at a level that's very affordable. Government will pay the premium for the more vulnerable. So elderly people uh, below a certain uh, pension level, um, uh, unemployed, uh, the, the, the poverty list, the vulnerable list, all those people government will pay, right? Um, and so that's why I'm saying to you that moving into OKEU requires us to have these systems in place and to have a system that can collect the insurance. Now, once I'm collecting the insurance number, I can now tie my inventory system. So when you're going in, I know what services you used and therefore it has to tally back to the inventory system. So this is where the management process comes in. We're also going to be introducing a health authority. The responsibility of the health authority is to do a couple things. One, work with the private doctors um, and everybody else to come up with a fixed price list for services. Two, to license all of the doctors um, and all of the facilities to make sure there's no abuse, that doctors aren't giving out false prescriptions to take advantage of the insurance system. Those are the things that cause the insurance prices to be able to go up. So we're putting all those mechanisms in place. I think that St. Lucia will become a model for a lot of other places once we've got that accomplished. Then you have St. Jude's. You know, in a very short time, St. Jude's hurts my heart. It hurts my heart on a multitude of levels in that. Uh, and uh, let's separate the politics from this thing. When you had the fire, the decision was made to build a new facility that would have replaced the existing services of the old facility. Under the Stevenson King administration, there was also the beginning of a discussion about building a new hospital for the South. And three locations were identified by the uh, brewery, by the old St. The, the St. Jude's facility, and then behind where the stadium, the, the stadium is, the George Alvum Stadium. When, when we lost the election, Stevenson King lost the election, the facility to replace St. Jude's was within months away of being operationalized. The then new government reviewed, which they're entitled to do, the existing situation, and made a decision to go ahead and build the new hospital in the existing location. In hindsight, I think that that was a bad decision. I think what they should have done is operationalized the old facility um, and allowed the people to have moved back from the stadium into the new facility. And even if they wanted to choose the same location, to have built it around that. But they didn't. As a consequence of that, and not having, and also as a consequence of not having all the money necessary 
to fill to build this new facility and not even having a design and doing it on a piecemeal basis we ended up with a situation in which after five years that they had spent 130 million dollars um, as well as not completing the project so when we came in we were told that the project was only going to be another three months which was fine then we were told well no it's going to take another six months and they need another 70 million dollars so at that point now you go and you do your own review the review showed me that what they had built was inadequate and that if we in fact attempted to complete the building even to get it to a minimum standard would require the demolition of certain aspects of the building and uh, conservatively would have had to spend a hundred million dollars so for me i said wow and, and for cabinet was say okay how much is it going to cost us to build a new facility so a new facility we believe we can build for 30 million US dollars, just, just over 100 million EC dollars. So the question is, do you try to fix up and amend a building that will never be of international standard, will at best be at minimum standard, or should we just build a proper world-class facility? And so the decision was made, let's build the world-class facility. We think we can do it cheaper, we can do it faster, and we're going to get a better quality facility. And then the question becomes, what do you do with the old building? So as many of the components of the old building that we can include in the new complex, we are. But we're also now out trying to get an investor to build a university, a medical university in that location. Why? We've seen the success of medical universities around the Caribbean. Um, St. George's, Ross University, St. Vincent, Dominica, you go down the stream. But we are offering something that doesn't exist anywhere which is that the university can have an, an, an operational hospital on the same campus as a, teaching hospital. as a teaching hospital. And we think that that's a significant added value that we can bring to the table. Also, when you take into consideration the new international airport, um, the new uh, office facilities, the possibility of a cruise ship terminal, the new, ho the new hotel rooms coming in, our desire to make the South the fastest growing area, you might as well put in a proper hospital because you're going to have to, at some point, do that anyway. So the goal is that um, we're, we've broken ground. Um, the money is there. The plans have been approved by DCA. Um, we have a really fabulous team of experienced people. OECC, which is this uh, Taiwanese international construction company that has experiences in building hospitals, will be overseeing the project and completing the project. And we're, we believe that we can have that project completed um, sometime next year. And so we're looking at with one year period to get it done. That's what our goal is. I mean, so, okay. I mean, uh, we, we, we will clearly know within by Christmas how far advanced we are. And I will give a more accurate update. But certainly by next year, the intention is to have the hospital completed and operationalized. What are we doing, what is your administration doing to uh, make conditions more comfortable at the stadium? Well, one, the- While we wait in. One, the closure of the garbage dump. Um, they had a major sewage problem there. Um, they had the roof problem. We've taken down the debris. Um, and despite what everybody was saying, all the results show there was very little fiberglass content in the roof, but that's all now down. Um, Re replacement of some of the air conditioners. The big one really is we've just put some new x-ray and MRI equipment in that location and continue to say to the staff there how much we appreciate what they're doing um, and to make it as easy as possible. Uh, but there is no short-term solution to their problem that would ever be to a satisfactory level. We just got to continue to rely on the hardworking people that are there to work through this process and the patience of the, uh, the people who are using it, many of them who come from my constituency. Um, it's a very sad situation, but I, I, am, I, I, I am comforted in knowing that the government has made resources available, made this an absolute priority, completely empathizes and in no way underestimates the crisis that we have. But we believe that by next year, 
boast and Jude's OKEU, the work that we're doing on the primary services. We didn't get to speak about Soufrere. We didn't get to speak about Denry. We didn't get to speak about the new polyclinic and facilities on the Chaussee Road, um, improving and increasing the hours of the polyclinic in Groselet, um, and all the added resources and equipment that we're putting into all those places. The combination of all of those things and then the coup de gras being the health insurance that we really believe that solutions now would have a healthcare system that we all can be proud of, but more importantly, that would be accessible to all St. Lucians, all St. Lucians. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for being part of our program today in Focus. Certainly we covered a number of areas really of serious importance to St. Lucians. That's of the economy, we looked at crime and security, and we finished off with health. You know, we could not exhaust all of them based on the time that we've had, but we're quite happy that you've been able to get an overview of the government's plans and policies regarding those areas. This has been In Focus. I'd like to also thank our co-host, uh, Lisa Joseph, for being part of our program. Thank you once more, Mr. Prime Minister, and to all the staff here at the Government Information Service and the National Television Network. I'm Ryan O'Brien saying join us next time when we go In Focus.